pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we're going to actually start. We have a couple appointments, but they're not all here yet. So we're going to start with um, just um, go from old business. Have any old business? Do you have any old business? I don't think so. Can't think of any. Old I would have a couple of motions to propose. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I would move to nominate Chuck Rage as chairman of the precinct. I will second. Okay. That it's in by acclamation. All in favor? <laughs> All in favor? Okay. All, All in favor? All in favor? All in favor? Is there I, any opposition? <laughs> no. no. But I move Maureen Buckley become the vice chairman of the village district. Oh, no, I'll second that. Well, here's another title. <laughs> All in favor? Another title. Unanimous again. It's a win. Thank point. you so much. Congratulations. <laughs> and my third motion would be to authorize any one of the three sitting commissioners to represent the precinct before the budget committee this year. And oh, thank God for that. And the board of selectmen any time that we need to go. Right. 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 I will, yeah. No. I wasn't trying to expand it. <laughs> yeah. no, he's just trying to pass the joy. Okay, so what is your motion? That we are all equally authorized to appear, particularly before the budget committee, as the representative of the precinct to the budget committee. And I would second that. I, all in favor? Should we Unanimous. make the same motion for the um, selectmen? Sure. So the same motion, but the selectmen? I think the selectmen as well as the budget. Actually, any town, we should just make it a blanket statement. Not that we need to vote for the best planning or anything, but if we did, okay. it would be any any of the boards. If we're already town. Yeah. Should we just have one motion? Yeah, just one. Just one. Okay, just For all of the boards. Yeah. Any, any or all of us can yeah. represent yeah. us. You are in charge of the dog catcher. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, all right. So I'm in. All right, so do we have to vote again? No. All right, so we just voted for that. All right. Sure. <clears throat> can I state for the record that who are you? The and speak up loudly People too. Branch, the treasurer. Speak up. The accountant wanted me to be on record that all of the payroll, the deed for the property for the clues, as well as the bank, all of the mortgage information, is in this locked safe, which is kept locked in our vault. Just for the record, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Was there something else you wanted to say? Do you remember the combination? Didn't he have another one? <laughs> it's a key yeah. one. I think you want to wait until he comes back out. I thought he had another thing he was yeah. ranting about. Yeah. Didn't he have another thing yeah. he wanted to talk about? Yeah. Was there anything else that the accountant wanted us to, to <laughs> yes. do? Yes, I should like to say to the board and to the people. Not publicly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> very good. That's all. Thank you very much. All right. Oh, I thought it had to be on record. I don't know. So, don't we have to... Didn't you want something on record? That... Well, bank. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The loan. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not. Oh, fine. I, it's on the record. It's all, of, it, all of it's in there. Okay. okay. It's in the, okay. Got it. the reason that he wanted me to do that is that he said 10 years from now, or 15 years from now, when we're not on this board any longer, and somebody says, where's the deed for that clues lot? You know, or what's, what were the terms of that loan? Is it paid? When, when, are we, when is it finished? Right. Yeah. We'll have, on record, yeah. somebody in the, in, the, in the audience that's younger or can look back at the minutes and say, it's in that safe that's in the vault. That's the reason that he wanted me to do that, okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's going to be one of the rage children. <laughs> Our grandchildren. Be, you know, 10 years is not that far. I know. No. You think we're going to all be dead? I'll be, in the, I'll be there. Not, so I hope I'll, I'll be uh, the, the beach historian in the, in the back. So. I have one further motion. I would move we formally welcome representative from the Board of Selectmen, Regina Barnes, as the representative to the precinct from the board. Welcome, Regina. Happy to be here. You have a lot of work ahead of you, huh? You do. <laughs> nice. We, we move to have you represent us at the budget committee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I already had to represent the selectmen. Well, you're going to have two votes. No. Um, so about, I would say, 
five, six weeks ago, Bob, Maureen, and myself went to um, meet with a professor, John Tomasi, at UNH. And they're doing a study. He, he has a student doing a study about the worth and, and, and all the things that the village district does. Um, so we're going to have, probably in another month, we're going to have results of, of, of this study. So I, I just thought I'd let everybody know to look for it. We'll have it. We'll have copies of it here at the next meeting, hopefully, and we'll probably, if we can, put it out on the uh, website. So that 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 should be interesting to see. Um, we do a lot of things, but a lot of people don't know that we do these things. So it'd be nice to see what the economic in impact is to the town. That's what it's going to be an economic impact. Mm -hmm. Economic impact. It's an impact study. Yeah. Great. Right. Jason, you guys want to come up? All right, so the CRS, um, which is, uh, Jason's going to talk about uh, with Julie. Yep. This is the uh, community rating system. We were before you back in December. I'm just going to give you a, a brief update of what we've been doing since then, and then I'll turn it over to Julie for some more specifics on and some of the work we've been doing. Um, since our last meeting in December, um, we've had Julie and Rayanne and I have had several working meetings. Um, for example, we've been working on repetitive loss maps. Um, we have many repetitive loss properties, as was previously discussed, and uh, it's an added layer of effort, you know, in our process. So it's a little bit of additional time. It's one of the steps that we have to meet to meet that step <coughs> on, um, classification. Um, working on fine-tuning our points that we're accumulating to get into the program uh, to determine where we may end up in that. Um, it would appear that we should have no problem reaching that class nine and getting into the program. Um, you know, the exact points are assigned that are assigned up to FEMA when they do their visit and that's, you know, out of our control, but we are, we believe strongly that we are on track to that. Um, an open space percentage of 25% that we have that helps considerably. And I'm sure Julie will speak more to that. Um, uh, Brianne and I participated in a FEMA verification uh, visit webinar. Um, that's one area where we have some work to be done yet. Um, Jennifer Gilbert from the Office of Energy and Planning um, is working with the building department to address some issues there regarding building permitting information for a few of the structures. And that must be done before the verification visit and ultimate you know, application for CRS. So that's one of the major milestones that has to be reached and, and that has to be cleaned up before we can really file our application. Um, but we are diligently moving forward. We've been very active since we last met. Um, but there are some hurdles still to cross before we can actually apply. A um, couple things that I did want to note for you is that Rayanne and I and actually Julie are attending a FEMA CRS training course in the beginning of May. Um, it's this whole process so far has been a very significant learning process for us and this course should help us in providing greater skills and tools so that we can ultimately move forward with getting into the program and once we are in the program maintaining our status in that program and actually building up the uh, classification ultimately. Um, we are also going to be working with the Rockingham Planning Commission to upgrade our flood ordinances through the Tides to Storms 2 grant that we received through them. Um, that Tides to Storms is a risk and vulnerability assessment um, involving sea level rise and storm surge. Um, but through that process, um, we'll be looking at innovative flood mitigation measures such as freeboard, which is uh, requiring buildings to be above base flood elevation, usually one to four feet above base flood of elevation. And it's just another way that we can potentially increase over time our point totals, you know, once we get into the program. So that's a summary of where we're at um, since we last met. And I'll turn it over to Julie now to speak to uh, some of the other points. Don't go far because there'll be questions, I'm sure. <laughs> I'll just stand where I was standing. <laughs> so here's a copy of our handout for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> So as Jason pointed out, we've been working on the the, the uh, short one. No, got enough. Oh, okay. Um, been working on the, the CRS checklist, which which is a series of act activities and actions that that the community can undertake to reduce their flood risk over time. And there are certain points afforded to that. Uh, as Jason mentioned, it's it's a little bit unknown as to the, you know the amount of points that we think we the, the town should should get versus what FEMA will ultimately uh, say 
are, are, are approved. So the, the total number of points is somewhat in flux, but we feel very confident that we can at least uh, gain a rating of 9. We have to have a rating of 10 to get into the program, which doesn't give you any discount on flood insurance. Rating 9 gives 5% uh, dis discount on flood insurance. And if there's a possibility, depending on what the, uh, after the visit, what FEMA tells us how many points we have, there is a possibility that we could even get to an 8, which will give a 10% discount on flood insurance. So I wanted to kind of go, just go over with you, with you briefly the, the additional activities that may be able to get us to an 8 in the, in the first round. Um, if that's not achievable in the second round of um, the next verification visit and if the town's taken steps and gotten more points, they may be able to rate, bump up to the, rate, the 8 rating. But the activities we're really focusing on are, are uh, on, this, on this sheet of paper here or this handout, and I've put a, uh, an arrow next to the ones that we're specifically targeting as part of the grant application process. And one of them is to increase outreach projects within, within, within the community. So we're, we're considering doing mailings and increasing the amount of information that's available at the town offices and at the town library. And also through, through perhaps venues that, or, or mailings that the, the district does as well to the, the people who live actually in, in, the, in the flood zone and the floodplain. So that's one, one area we're trying to improve upon. Um, over on the next page, <coughs> mapping and re regulatory activities. There's 99 points available here, and we're not sure how many points we can actually get because we have done some of the some of the uh, action items here, but we're not exactly sure if we'll get half, we'll get a quarter, 30 percent, whatever we'll get. But through the tides to storms vulnerability assessment that we completed last year for the town and for the entire coast, we did map things like sea level rise, and we did take into consideration changes from climate change. So we don't know exactly how many points they'll they will give us for that. Um, moving down to the next one, the open space mm -hmm. preservation, we've identified all of the permanently preserved. Uh, pieces of land that lie in the special flood hazard area, which are the 100-year and 500-year floodplains, that the town actually owns a number of what they call salt marsh parcels that they've acquired over time through whatever re reasons, tax liens or delinquent, whatever. Um, and they're, you know, the town just has no intention of developing them, but in order to, for those to qualify for points, they have to be permanently protected against development. So the town would have to take some action, and we believe it may require a vote at town meeting. <coughs> for the town to say that we'll put these parcels in preservation in perpetuity. And if that happens, then you know, there's 203 points at play here. So it could be an, a, a tremendous bump in the number, number of points. But we're not sure if that's something that could happen in the course of the, uh, this current application cycle. Um, we are, as Jason mentioned, looking at the, uh, f the current uh, floodplain standards that exist in the town zoning ordinance that relate to the, the development in the floodplain and regulate how, where, when, and what gets built in the, in that fl in the floodplain. Uh, there is potentially some, some wiggle room to, um, to adopt some what they call regulations administration and some, maybe perhaps some, some regula regulations in the land use site plan review and subdivision regulations that could, could maybe uh, account for some of the points here. Um, and, and not necessarily require a zoning change. So we're looking at what, what op options we have to change the regulations in a, in a minimum way to get at least gain some points. Um, and then we're looking at some of the bookkeeping that the town does under, that's activity 440, looking at maintenance of flood data, how much we can actually accomplish in standardizing and uh, digitizing some of the record keeping that happens, like uh, digitizing and, and scanning all the flood elevation certificates for all the buildings that are in the floodplain. Things like that could actually help to gain points under this, and this is also worth uh, over 100 points. Another area that we may be able to make some strides in very quickly, and I haven't talked to Jason about this yet in detail, but um, the planning board is able to amend the, the, the uh, site plan review and subdivision re regulations without town a town vote. That's just done with a public hearing through the planning board. And there, there may be um, options to actually implement some of the new, newer development regulations. So, for example, uh, controlling runoff in the, pre, in, the, in the developed state so that it's not worse than what it was before it was developed. That's a minor change. So we're going to look, look and see what we can do there. Again, that's 130 points available. And then ultimately we'll be looking at changing um, Activity 510, which is on the following page, the flood floodplain management standards and, and a comprehensive plan. And that's a more forward-thinking, longer-term project. Um, 
And then one thing that we could, the town could potentially develop is a plan for Activity 540, which is drainage system maintenance, to, to develop a plan where they would periodically inspect the channels and retention basins uh, all around in the special flood hazard area. So that would require them to probably develop a plan and for the selectmen to probably to sign off on that, on, on that, using staff time to do that maintenance requirement. But there's 207 points there. So as you can see, there's lots of stuff in play. So if we can, if we can identify and, and bring to the town's attention, the selectmen's attention, these additional efforts, if they would allow us to or, or give you know, permission to have us use some of these, these uh, elements or put forward some of these elements, we may be able to get more points and bump us up to that 800. I mean, that, eight, that systems class rate of eight, of eight, rating of eight, which allows the property owners to have 10% discount on it. Insurance and the difference between a five and, and a, I mean an eight and a nine class rating is only 500 points. So you can see when you add up all these points, if we can just get little bits of points, 50 here, 100 there, whatever, we may be able to get ourselves over that hump and get into the class eight. So we're continuing to work on all of these things, and so we're, we definitely are hopeful that um, with no with a lot of ease we'll be able to, to achieve the, the class nine rating. On the front page, activity 350, isn't that, isn't that something easy that could be done? Yes, that's part of the, yes, that, that's another, that's one the, the town is actually already doing. And Rayanne and Jason and I have already identified some more materials. Oh, so can, some of this is additional. Yeah. This is what you're working on yeah. now that you just mm -hmm. oh, yeah. okay. Great. I have a question about for activity 420. You mentioned that the, uh, <clears throat> the um, town has no intention of build, uh, having any building on the um, salt marsh properties and you said but they'd have to do something to show that they're permanently protected what would that be uh we're not that's one thing i'm looking into now whether it has to be sort of something like an affidavit or, or if the deeds have to be somehow uh some sort of agreement that's that references each one of the deeds that be put into the recorded in the registry of deeds that they've taken in action but that action may require a town vote we're not exactly sure so we're looking into the legal aspects of how to <coughs> execute that because that's, that one actually gets a, a huge amount of points for a little yeah, more. Yeah, and that doesn't seem like a big deal if they right. did it. Right, exactly. So what we're trying, we've identified these, this, 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 this priority list of activities, and what we're trying to do is find out which ones are the easiest and fastest to complete. Wow. <coughs> that will get us, the, get us the most points. Okay. On 420, wasn't our planning board basically, I know my mother-in-law ended up having to give away a lot of marshland because they basically came and said to her, you can't build any more condos in water. She owns the, she owned the uh, Sunset Condominium. Mm -hmm. It's worth a marsh, and she owned a lot of that property. So she would not give away the rest of us because we couldn't use this. And there must have been something that said, you can't do this. So mm -hmm. Don't we only have something? I mean, I, I know, um, you know, you can, going before the board, you have to have a buffer of so many feet, and, and you can't go into that. So well, isn't it already there on our laws? Well, it's, I'll let Jason plan, you know, address the planning board part. But, yes, there, is, there are state laws that say that you need, to, you need a substantial permitting from the state to be able to build and, and, and title wellings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, above, below mean high water, which it sounds like that's probably what a lot of the land was. So there's a steep curve, and um, it's not a guarantee that you would ever get a permit to build. Right. And as far as the planning board, I'll let Jason address that part. Yeah, I I'd say that's accurate. I mean, you have your uh, wetland conservation district, and obviously uh, your wetland areas too that are you know that would be built upon. But also, the question here is in perpetuity, and you know that mm -hmm. may require some sort of you know amendment to the deed, some sort of legal uh, response to to make that happen. In addition to what we already require, so yes, I mean most likely those areas would not be developed anyway. But there might have to be some sort of security to ensure that, and that may be the measure. Yep. So some of the, when we looked at the actual, the database Excel spreadsheet of, of the different properties that are located in this special flood hazard area that were identified as conservation, they fell in several different categories. So some were, were owned by the Society for Protect Protection of New Hampshire Forests. Others were owned by the town but under permanent conservation easement. Others were just town property, like the salt marsh parcels, and others were owned by um, the state. And the state, even though they hold them as parks and they don't, Put any sort of lien or, or, or requirement that they'll never develop, develop on them. So those those non deeded permanent conservation easement, easements properties to, can't be counted as it's this, it says very clearly in the guidance in the CRS uh, manual that you need permanent some documentation of permanent preservation. Uh, I see these 
identified activities that are to be done to get in the rating system mm -hmm. as a pretty good template to address the sea level rise <coughs> commission's report that has just come out recommending a whole range of things some of which are quite unappealing to the community Dire. and others are doable yes i've always believed somewhere between nothing and a hundred reality is uh, uh, and I hope we tilt at least toward the center of that. Mm -hmm. It seems to me critical that we now start reviewing, particularly zoning laws and the placement of mechanicals or first floor construction that allows for water, identifying what can be protected. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're all stewards of the place. We always hear the same thing in this community. We love Hampton. We love Hampton Beach. I came here 30,000 years ago as, as an ancestor. Well, now we have to step up and be part of protecting it, I think. So I hope that you people are closely coordinating with uh, the planning board in terms of um, the overlap that this clearly represents. And, and we are doing that. And as, you know, as I mentioned, the other item that we'll be working on amending our flood ordinances and the grant that we have for that, that goes mm -hmm. hand in hand with what you're talking about right right there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it all does overlap, and, and it is something that is high on my radar and, and very important to me to make sure that we're proceeding with these things, and I know it's, it's important to the planning board as well. So certainly we are we are working on those things. Yeah. The other thing I, I'd just like to say to Obwater, especially in front of Brendan, um, Jason, um, since day one, kid, you've taken over that office and, and you're doing a great job. And, and you should be proud of yourself, what you've done and accomplished so far. And we're, I'm very proud of the fact that you walked in there and sat down. And, and, and like I said, you sat down, kid, at 100 miles per hour, and you've done a wonderful job in that office. And it's a pleasure that we have you. And, and, uh, and I'd like to say it in front of Brendan. Brendan, knowing, you know, also what a great job you've done there. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll second that. <laughs> All in favor. Yeah. It's unanimous. I never get to do that. I never get to do that. <laughs> Well, I, I actually was part of the, uh, the group that, that wrote the draft report for the Coastal Commission, so we are very well aware of what the recommendations are, and many of these are reflected in that report. And if you read through these, though, I think the one thing that, that really, I think, strikes you and, and stands out is that even if no floods ever happen in the community, these will help the community overall anyway. They're, all, they're just good practices, just generally, for land development and for just protecting the floodplain. So I, I think that they're, regardless of what the future brings here to Hampton Beach, I think that the, these, these will help the community be a better place to live. So. Do you have any plans to go before the Board of Selectmen to kind of complete the loop in terms of what to do and how to do it? Yeah, I we think we should, yeah. yeah I th and I th we did. Yeah, I think we'll be doing that um, as we continue to move forward in this process, you know, mm -hmm. keeping them up to date. I think that's a good forum to be to spe speaking, and I know we've updated this group a few times now, but I do think that would be our next step. Mm -hmm. We're just tweaking the, the points on the in, in the checklist, and we, we had a meeting with Ray and Richard uh, earlier this week on Monday, and we basically came up with sort of a priority list, and, and we did target those open space parcels as being something. So we need to make a few inquiries about the legal mechanisms to and make that happen, and we were, yeah, I think the next step is to take present what needs to happen next now to, to achieve the maximum amount of points to the selectmen to see if they'll, they'll, uh, they'll uh, endorse them. And as I understand it, we were only eligible to apply in May and October for the rating. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. And obviously May is out. What is the likelihood we'd be ready to make the application by October? I think we'll be ready to make an application in October for to, to reach the Class 9 rating. Mm -hmm. uh, we may take uh, some zoning amendments and other things if we were to, to try and get to 8. It, but again, if, if those open space parcels, if we can get that situated, if we can get that done without the town vote, that would be uh, would bring us a long, long way forward. And a couple of the, like the maintenance, the maintenance of the drainage systems, if we could do that, those two things may push us over, the, bump us over. So pretty soon we'll know. Mm -hmm. um, but it would make sense that if, if um, we're talking about that if we, need some, if we needed a few extra 100 points and it needed a zoning, like the conservation parcels need to go to town meeting for a vote, it may make sense to delay the application to May. That way you're going in with maximum points to get to eight instead of nine and having to wait you know, another cycle to get there. 
So I think that's that's a, something we'll present to you and the selectmen and see what the town decides <coughs> what, uh, which direction they'd like to take. But with a with a couple of minor, I think reasonable efforts, we may be able to m make the rate eight, the eight rating at, um, for the October filing. Well, that's pretty encouraging. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That's awesome. Something I've heard you say that I find encouraging is you're not attacking the messenger in the sea level rise report which becomes a distraction from the importance that's being represented in those conclusions. And I assume like Seabrook's town planner, you'll be working collegially and cooperatively toward whatever can be done. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, we all talk to each other. I'm working with Seabrook, actually. We're, we're creating a new master plan chapter on coastal hazards and adaptation right now for, the, for that right. town. And there, we just had a all staff meeting actually at, um, the other other day. It's a Tuesday, and all of the department heads know how important it is for everyone to participate in finding solutions and figuring the flood problems out for that town. So I think it's nice that the communities are really rallying around how best to protect the community, and in a, in a, in a cost effective way. Yeah. Any news on when the new flood maps will be uh, certified? Um, I thought that was still 2017. Um, I don't know the exact date, but I thought it was early 2017, the last night. For the, for the release for the, of the final? Or yeah. for the, uh, uh, I think yeah. so. Yeah. They're waiting for, there was, yeah, there yeah. was a procedural er error. So, um, yeah, 2017 probably. Is the um, <clears throat> federal government, is, they're supposedly, they already have it, it's out to bid to build a new jetty. With the new jetty being built, Will that help us at all? Where is the jetty? South Beach, at the state park. Oh, there. The I see. The jetty's being the jetty's being rebuilt by the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. They okay. put it out to bid, and uh, I don't know if they've received any bid yet. But I'm just wondering, with the repair of the jetty, will that? Do you think that will have any bearing on helping us get to a higher rate? Probably not. It's it's more of a, a, a stabilization, you know, effort and, and, and structure for the mouth of the estuary because that, that whole area is very dynamic and you lose sand one year, you get it back a little bit the next year. So in order to keep that that area and especially the, I think there's a, re, isn't there a revetment at the, at the edge of the, the, the parking lot, I think, at the beach there. So this is some stone and everything there already. In order to keep that in place, because it, it sounds like it's deteriorating, they need to, need to, dampen the wave energy that hits it and that's what the, what the jetty does it also captures sand behind it so that the beach behind it will actually accre accrete some sand accumulate sand but it won't really make a difference to flooding i just wonder because it does work as a breakwater coming into the river right the energy yep mm -hmm. yep exactly our biggest flooding issues are from the marsh right yeah. not so much from the, the coming into the beach and freshwater flooding too what happens, especially if it's a storm where, if it's a storm and it has rain associated with it, you have a lot of low-lying areas that collect water, and, and the storm drains, especially if it's a high tide, close, and they cannot, they cannot discharge water. So all that extra water is just pools up, and so you get a combination of tide water and fresh water together. One thing I wanted to mention is that there are some other benefits to, the, to doing some of the things that are on this list, especially the stormwater management standards and the drainage system maintenance, that those are also things that you can get credit for for your MS4 permit, which is an EPA permit um, that, the, that the town has, has, and they have certain requirements for water quality and stormwater management as part of that. And that is if these two actually could get, you could get credit under the new permit. The new permit will be issued shortly because Massachusetts just issued theirs a couple a couple of days ago. So the New Hampshire permit should be forthcoming in the next month or so, a month or two, and it'll become effective next year. So these are activities that the town will be able to take credit for as part of that permit. So it's not just a twofer. It's a twofer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is there any potential benefit in the sewer pipe that's going to have to be replaced from Church Street to the wastewater treatment plan, getting any points for a new pipe or a new location for that pipe? I wouldn't think so. I don't think it's so. Oh, no. no, yeah. Yeah. Not so much interest. Yeah. Well, uh, you're very encouraging today. 
You've been very cooperative. We're, we're really happy, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When Jason said, I'd like to come, I assumed he was bringing good news. <laughs> uh, and uh, the timing couldn't be more exquisite with the Sea Level Rise Commission report, the things you folks are doing. It's all so intertwined. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, you'll continue to do them, and we'll be able to tell us something very nice around October or September. Probably before that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We're very hopeful, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I would yeah. make a suggestion that any any memo or any information that we present to the selectmen, we will copy you on it so Absolutely. that you can let you know when we're going if you want to attend, but also if, if we have any memo or anything like that associated with it, we can copy you on that. Yeah. We That's appreciate great. that. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, mm -hmm. At what point uh, in round numbers, are we talking about a bond for the town or bonding so or how what's the matching from the town there is none actually what this is is a, it's a program from uh, through FEMA that allows uh, the community to to undertake a series of activities um, and of your choosing whichever you choose to and each one has a, a point a point system associated with it and if you achieve a certain amount of points and I think it's on the back page yeah, there's the table yeah so the table that's on page four mm -hmm. um, it shows the different amount of number of points that you need to achieve different levels and or, or, or what you call classes. So in order to get into the into the program, you have to have at least 499 uh, points, but it doesn't give you any discount on your flood insurance. So the further you go up in points, the, the more you get uh, the class rating goes up, and the more you get a discount on flood insurance. So the 10, 5 percent, 10 percent, 15, and so on, is the amount that each individual. Uh, property owner that has a national flood insurance policy on your property will have on a yearly basis a as a discount. So every year that flood insurance premium will be 5% <coughs> or 10% less depending on what class we actually achieve. So there's no match, there's no nothing. It's just a whoever ha whoever is a property owner that has flood insurance through the, through the national federal program uh, will 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 take advantage of that that discount. Is this perpetual? Yes, as long as you as long as you maintain certain things and you you make sure that you're following the guidelines according to the the, the point system that you've already achieved. Mm -hmm. So maintaining records properly and all that kind of thing. Right, and that's that's what I was speaking to about over time. You know, being able to enhance, you know, build upon our class and our point total, and, and subsequently discounts for flood insurance by continuing to do. The things that allow us to get the discount, and also new things that um, you know, they can work us up higher in the mm -hmm. classification. Is the discount a yearly thing? Or Every year. It, does it um, yearly? Aggregate. Yearly. Okay. In New Hampshire, because of the the way the state building code is structured, New Hampshire uh, pro municipalities can only achieve as a high rating as seven. Um, they're looking to change that so that communities can go higher, but. 15% then would, uh, with a rating of 7 would be the cap, for, just for now. But that, that may change in the future with changes in building code. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there's a list below that. The table below shows the list of the, the, the small number of communities that are actually in the program and the ratings that they've achieved. So Keene and Peterborough are the only two towns that um, have a 10% the, the, the Class 8 rating out of the four. So you'll be the fifth, hopefully. <laughs> Interesting. There's no one uh, that's mm -hmm. on the Merrimack River. Uh, no. Village floods out a lot. And yep. There's no one else in the seacoast. I'm surprised. Rye is, is, is it used to be in the program, and Rye is, is go also um, will be applying. Thank you. Yeah. I know, but you know the thing is, though, <coughs> even though it doesn't affect a wider area, it's, it's very rural, and there are fewer property owners with flood insurance so it's sort of it, it's a it's it is a it is an effort and the town I think Hampton probably wouldn't have gone forward with this effort if they hadn't received a grant to actually help them do it um, but like Bob. Yeah, yes exactly <laughs> and there are towns like Hampton Falls that that have limited limited areas of impact and they only think they have something like 20 something property owners with, 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 with flood insurance national flood insurance so it's not really worth going through all of this for them to, for that amount of but you have thousands of policies, so that makes a big difference. When you start, I don't think ever, we could probably aggregate the policies in effect and find out what the, maybe we should do that. Find out, idea. get an aggregated amount of how many policies and what, what they're worth, which I think actually, I think we have those statistics and we can come up with a number of how much. It would be nice to say. We, the, you would save. The job you did just saved the town. Can I borrow your pen? Uh, yes, the, the town. 
four hundred eighty thousand dollars or something. It would be right. It would be great to, to know the number. Discount. Well, this is what private and private homeowners, uh, you know, save. But yeah, well, you know. we get raised in all kinds. Yeah. But the, the town will see in dollars what the effort actually, and their, their efforts to maintain some of these points will actually get right. the community. That'd be great. Great. Well, I'll, I'll, we'll see if we can get that to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Brendan McNamara from the Planning Board. You're on. Can you tell Good us evening, what we need everybody. To do? Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation. I have to tell you, the planning board very rarely seeks uh, or gets any attention at all, so this is kind of exciting for us. Uh -huh. um, what I'd like to do is I'll just introduce myself, and then I'll, I'll um, let Jason speak about what the town planner and what the planning department does, because it's very, they do a lot, more than what you see on the TV if you ever watch the meetings. Behind the scenes is an incredible amount of information that comes in and out from different departments, from Everybody, builders, FEMA, every, everything, the planning department is, is a lot bigger than what you see. When he's done, I'll talk about um, what the elected officials do, and if you have questions. But you may not. It's kind of boring what we do yeah. compared to what they do. But um, if, uh, as he talks, if you have questions, when he's done, let's, let's answer him, and um, I'll come back up, and we'll wrap that up. Okay? Jason? Julie, thanks again. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, thanks for your help. Okay, bye. All right. So I'm back. <laughs> back. Okay. With a different right. hat on. Though. Different hat, that's yeah. right. <laughs> Same address. It's it. yep. So I'm just going to go through some of the responsibilities of the planning office and some of the things that we do just so you have a feel for that. Um, I'd say the most critical thing we do, and to put it brief, is to provide technical and administrative support to the planning board and guide them, the board, in making informed decisions and their, their procedures. Um, I'll get into some specifics of some work that I've done. We have, obviously, Lori Olivier in our office. That's, you know, Lori and I, it's, I think it's a very strong office, but only a two-person office, so it's very, very busy. We're on the go all the time. Um, in terms of zoning, the zoning ordinance, um, we prepare zoning amendments and bring them through the required process, the planning board public hearing and recommendation, a formal <coughs> public presentation, a deliberative session, and adoption at town meeting. Upon adoption, we update and reformat the zoning ordinance accordingly and put it on the website and redistribute to staff, and, and it's available for sale, of course, too. Um, the site plan and subdivision regulations. We also prepare site plan and subdivision regulation amendments and bring them to the planning board for, for public hearing. As was noted, actually, in the previous uh, um, item, it's not subject to town meeting vote. It's just something that can be approved by the planning board, but it is noticed and, and all. Um, planning board applications. Uh, we process applications for site plan review, subdivision, change of use, condo conversion, wetlands permit, partial impact fee waivers for school impact fees when, request, when those waivers are requested, driveway permit appeals when a driveway permit is rejected by DPW, and temporary parking lots. Um, once we receive those applications, it includes a thorough review of the submittals for completeness and accuracy. And I'm going to give you some examples of some projects under each of these. Under site plan, um, projects definitely relevant to the beach area. We have 3133 Ocean Boulevard, N Street, 128 Ashworth, and 377 Ocean, many of the condo projects that we've seen down the beach recently. Um, just at the last meeting last week, we approved the project for Bernie's Beach Bar at 7170, or the board, I should say, did for 7173 Ocean Boulevard um, for a second-story deck over there. Um, other projects elsewhere in town, we have the Cornerstone Health Care Facility on Exeter Road, and a hotel office project right across the street from that next to CRs that's currently in the PRC process. And I'll, I'll talk about the PRC process as well. Um, subdivisions, a couple key ones on 376 Winnicott Road, a Hillier Drive, and 86 Woodland Road subdivision, Robertson Drive, I believe it's called. Um, condo conversions, we get a number of those applications. Uh, one down the beach here, 2123 Concord Ave, came through the planning board um, last year. Um, change of use, um, so we have a couple examples here. We had a school to professional office on High Street back uh, several months ago. We also had on 169 Ocean Boulevard retail to takeout. So, 
you know, when it, basically when there's a different use classification change there, it comes through as a change of use. Um, we've amended our zoning. Um, the voters voted to approve an amendment to the definition of change of use. So now that also brings in residential changes of use. So if there's a single family to a two family, previously the planning board wouldn't have seen that. Now under the new amendment, they're going to see that as a change of use. It's a pretty simple process. It's not the full multifamily site plan approval that would otherwise be required if you went to three or more units. Um, partial impact fee waivers, those condo projects that I mentioned, I'll request and receive those. Um, wetlands permits, uh, we have in May coming up for Ocean Drive as an amended uh, wetlands permit. Um, it's a new home down on the other side of the, the bridge here, and they're doing seawall stairs, as I understand it, and 18 Johnson Ave is a fenced installation. So that's an example of wetlands permits that we see. Uh, driveway permit appeals, we have a couple coming in May on Ocean Boulevard and, and Plymouth Street. And we just approved, or the planning board just approved uh, last week, a temporary parking lot, 101 Ocean Boulevard, which is the site of the Beach View Inn, which unfortunately has to be removed due to fire, and their parking lots on I Street. So they'll have a one year, and those are one year temporary approvals. They can go back to the planning board each year to, to renew those if they wish. Um, the site plan and subdivision applications go through the plan review committee process. That's with town staff. Uh, CMA engineers, the town's engineering consultant, Aquarian and Unitil, um, before consideration by the planning board. And most plan issues get flushed out at that stage. Um, following planning board approval, we make sure that any required conditions have been met before the recording the plans. And at part of my arrival, what I did was we provide a planner's memo to, to the board, and I made it a more structured process where these conditions have to be met before the plans recorded, these have to be met before a building permit, and these before CFO. It just makes it more organized and uh, a smoother process for everybody. Um, we have pre-construction meetings uh, with town staff, CMA engineers, Aquarian and Unitil, and the applicant and their contractors before uh, building permits are issued for construction as well. And we work with uh, CMA on, on getting that coordinated. And we're always working on further improvements to our application process. It's an ongoing effort. You know, we find flaws here and there, and we work to, to make them better. Um, just some other items that we do in, in the planning office. Um, you know, I, I've attended many meetings of various town boards and committees, as requested and otherwise. Uh, we routinely attend, or I routinely attend and participate in the HBAC meetings, as many people know, and uh, provide prof professional support as needed. Uh, we also prepare and present the annual budget for the planning office, um, participate in various community activities and events, which enhance the presence of the planning, op planning office in the community. For example, the New Hampshire Seacoast Greenway, which the Rocky and Planning Commission is working with other communities. I participate in that uh, committee. Safe Routes to School, Hampton Academy project when that was being worked on, so, and, and more than that. So just some examples there. We also work closely, as, as you can see, with the CRS project with Julie, the Rockingham Planning Commission, on that and a variety of other planning initiatives. We also work with state agencies on various planning efforts, project review matters, and proposed legislation as it affects Hampton. For example, the planning board's been discussing accessory dwelling units, and that's a new uh, state law now, and we're going to have to amend our zoning for that. Um, routine site visits and inspections for uh, applications coming before the board. Um, you know, um, other key sites, for example, under construction um, that require C of O, we check those out, too. Um, master plan update, it's not something I've had an opportunity to get deep into yet, but I've done a cursory review of our master plan and looking to determine whether it's best to update some sections, do a comprehensive uh, update. We're still working toward that. And on that note, uh, the HBAC has been working on the beach master plan transportation update, and I've been assisting with that. Um, I established a zoning review committee, uh, the planning board did in, in 2015, and it looked at the Exeter Road Liberty Lane area where the uh, healthcare facility and hotel projects are and provided recommendations and similar efforts I anticipate will, will be taken in the future in other areas of town. Um, and the biggest thing too, and it's a huge thing, assisting the public with various inquiries. I mean, we get constant inquiries from the public requiring searching the archives for old files and, and giving them good information to help them out for whatever purpose. Uh, we do maintain an open door policy and make our best effort to address questions and concerns in a timely manner. So that's, and there's a lot more, but that's a good, I think, solid overview of what we do. What do you um, do in your spare time? Yeah. Not much. There's no spare time. <laughs> but I'll turn it over to Brendan now if you'd like to pick it up from there at the planning board. 
That's a lot. That's a lot. I don't know what else to say. That's a lot. And he's he kind of touched on things, but it's even better or bigger than that. So um, I get a kick out of it when he says, um, we we approve this. He said, no, the planning board. It's we. It's the department, him, Lori, and the planning board all together. The planning board is elected so that you guys can talk to us. He has his job. So does Lori. The planning department acts as a department in town. They technically work for the planning board. They are town employees. But we recruit. We bring them in. We pay them. We let, you know, if they, it's, it's, it's us, but it's the town that pays them. So the planning board is unique in that sense because we're the only board that actually has its own employees and its budget that we pay our people and, and they do it. When they come to us and say, this is our recommendations, if four or more agree with them, four or more members, there's six of us that are elected and there's one that's a ex facto person from the selectman board. If four or more of us agree with them, then we, we vote to agree. If we, if we don't, then we don't. So it's still on the elected officials to follow through and to carry it out. So you still have the power as the people that vote, and the elected officials still have the final say. The planning department comes up with the information. They present it to us. We use our collective minds to hopefully come to the right decision. So that's the, the overall sense of what goes on there. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff w behind the scenes that you don't see, and, and I definitely don't want to bore you with that. I mean, he, that just made me dizzy <laughs> in a good way. But um, we, we look at legislation that comes down. They look at it first. They bring it to us. If we need to respond, we recently, he, he touched on the fact that um, there's a, a process that's Senate Bill 146 that is a, an accessory dwelling unit. You probably don't know about this. What it means is that if Walter or John or Chuck or Maureen wants to take a piece of their home and turn it into an apartment for somebody to live, you can now. The state allows it. Never could before. Now, you can just build it with to our standards. With a permit, of course. Oh, absolutely. Everything requires permits. Everything requires standards. Everything requires every due diligence that the planning department has as its means. But right now, there's a state law that the planning board in this town did not agree with, and we sent a letter to the governor telling her that we thought that it might be detrimental to the town. But she signed it, and it's now a law. What we have to do is, is to look at our zoning regulations and amend them so that your neighbor can't just put up an accessory dwelling unit, even though it's within the law and with permits and absolutely done the right way. We're going to talk about that. We're going to discuss that. We're going to fix it. Hopefully. But right now, if you want to put in a mother-in-law apartment, you can. But your mother-in-law doesn't have to live there. You can rent it to whoever you want. Yeah. Actually, Brenda, can I jump in on that? Sure, come on. Yeah. The, law, the law actually does not take effect until June 2017. So we have an opportunity to update our ordinance prior to then, and that's yeah. why we have to do it in this upcoming cycle. So if you have and, it, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. And I was going to say, and we can't disallow them, but we can actually put certain requirements on them we can make it so that the house looks like any single family house on the street there's a lot of there, you know utilities water and sewer things of that nature um but we can have like a conditional use permit process where there's a very high level of scrutiny um but but we're refining that we're learning more about the law and we're refining that and figuring out how we're going to actually craft the actual regulation it's a work in progress and we're not looking to stop somebody from putting an accessory dwelling unit on their property or in their home. We're not looking to do that. We just don't want, I'm afraid, and I think that the rest of my board members agree with me, we're afraid of what that might do to our own infrastructures, to our wastewater treatment plant. You could literally go out there and take every home in Hampton and put another unit, another, you could double it. All of that is going to hit our system pretty hard. And that's not what we want. Not right now. We need to fix it. We need to slow it down and contain it. We don't want to stop people from doing what they want with their property. That's America. I, I encourage that. We just don't want um, to be, to, to not, we don't want to not plan. We don't want to be 
blindsided and, and just let things happen and then say later on, oh my God, why did we let that happen? So that's just one particular area that we're really diligent right now on, on working on and finding a way that we don't inter intercede with the law, we don't stop people from using their, utilizing their, their property because that's their right, but we don't want it to hurt you and you and you and you. It's, it's a problem that we'll, we're going to work with. And it's going to take a while, but as Jason said, it's not going to happen tomorrow. The law doesn't kick in for a year. We're going to deal with it, hopefully. Um, but that's what the planning board does. That's what he does. That's what we do. We look for the future. We're the guys that when you pull into a parking lot and you're having a hard time driving around it and you say, who's the fool that allowed this to go forward? Us. <laughs> <laughs> That's us. But we try not to. We try to fix it. We try to make it right before you get to that point where you say, oh, my God, who did that? Yeah, we're going to try to fix it. So we're going to try to fix a few things. So. We, we did go through quite a few years, I mean, back in the, in the 80s and 90s, where zoning and planning was just done without any regulations. I mean, you could talk to the firefighters in town, and they'll tell you that, you know, they, they, they've been in buildings that they, they were in before that they inspected, and then there's been a fire in that building, and they go back, and, and they find themselves walls that have been moved, and yeah. doorways that have been moved, and hallways that have been closed off and, and made into one-bedroom bunk beds, and, and, and they will tell you the horrors that they see going inside these buildings. But you guys have done a great job. I, I, I will be one of the first ones to tell you. Uh, you know, Brendan, you know what this kid's done since he came in the I recruited him. I was one of them. I know. One of the seven that, that brought him in. So give him a lot of credit, but he had Laurie to help him. And she's yeah. awesome. yeah. oh, <laughs> I have to tell you, I, I have no choice. I what, I mean, but I do give you a lot of credit. Well, Laurie no, deserves a lot. I have, <laughs> what, basically, what, what happened was... <coughs> Laurie came in and uh, assumed the position in the um, planning office. And then when the town planner at that time um, was uh, disengaged from our employment, she had to fill in his shoes. And she did it, which is a big jump. Different from the professional planner, but filled the shoes. Big jump. And she filled it. I mean, she's done a wonderful job. She will. She, she will continue to. She likes her position, I believe. And we, we very much love her. So great. I don't know what else to say. But I, kudos to, to Lori. So. so back to the accessory unit. Yes. Um, a lot of, like, in-law apartments were approved as in-law apartments. Yes. Does this mean if that the in-law passes away that that can be, Absolutely what it means, yes. They can yes. do anything they want with you it. You could rent it to... Whoever you so even whoever if it was choose. contingent that an in-law lived in that apartment. No such contingency. Yeah, there's no you can't require a familiar nope. relationship under the legislation. Nope. Absolutely not. You can now double or you can now put a new part of your home into a rental space, basically. And we're worried about things like putting another unit on the same on the same lot. Of course, remember, this is all within our current guidelines. You can't put a, another unit within the same lot if it's too close to the buffer. No, that's going to stop it anyway. But if you do have enough space, if you live somewhere in, 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 a, in, in the town that doesn't have that buffer hitting on the back like we do down here, you could put it... With, it's new. It's still an infant. We're trying to make sure that the people that it's intended for statewide are that the law is, is taken, and we, we don't have any choice. It's a law. But what we can do, as Jason said, is we can make sure that whatever is done is done in accordance with our ideas and also kept down to a point where it's manageable, hopefully. Could it be a separate building? That it's it's in the it's not at this point, but it's but the way it's written. I don't know what could happen in, in a couple of years in Concord. I don't know. But it's called an accessory dwelling unit. Right now, it's in the home. So that'd be we, don't, we don't have to require a detached accessory dwelling unit. We can craft our regulations so that we don't require that. But we can't prohibit someone from having one that is attached to the main. Okay. But that, means that, that, that doesn't mean that it's inside your home. It means that you can 
build an addition for the sole purpose of renting it out. Oh, which is okay, but now we have zones that you can't do that. We have zones that it's a single family, and that's it. This takes that away. There's no more single family zones. Wow. That's, that's the biggest problem. It's not that you have the space and you're in a zone where there are accessories, that, where you do have a mother-in-law apartment. If you've got an extra space upstairs and you can make that attic nice, and absolutely, you know. But there, is, there are areas that you're not supposed to do that. Mm. But that's all gone. I mean, the problem with the legislation, I think, is that they took it as a one-size-fits-all approach, which you cannot do. I mean, there's communities in New Hampshire where this is probably perfectly appropriate, maybe even detached. But we are so dense. Our lot sizes are very small. It's such a dense community. And yeah. It's just, I think it just it, puts a burden on us. It doesn't necessarily fit Hampton. Same structure. Mm -hmm. it, it, it fits a lot. The reason for the law wasn't just to increase habitable space. It was because they had... They know that there's a student population that needs housing. They know that there's an elderly population that needs housing. They know that there's that there's issues in some communities that we need to increase housing without having to build an entire new home. That's what the law is about. In Hampton, we're not like everybody else. I've got 5,000 square feet down here. There's a cottage there. If you want to put a little addition on and you don't quite touch the 50 foot, and you oh. If you want to go uptown and, 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 and wherever you are, if you want to do that, it will add so much stuff. If Let's take the worst case scenario. If everybody in town that owned a home could put in an accessory dwelling unit, our entire infrastructure, wastewater treatment, everything else, is going to double, other than the commercial businesses. That's an issue. It's something we have to worry about. That's why we call it a planning board. That's why Jason is a town planner. We have to plan for the future. This isn't in our face today. It's in our, it's in our hands. We have to deal with it. But it's coming down the road, what the issue is. And that's why we are here. We are here to plan for the future and to make sure, aside from the, the dwelling units, the other thing the planning board does is when somebody wants to do something with, a, with an empty lot or with a current use of a hotel or, or a, an office building or anything, and they want to change it, then they need to come back and talk to us just to let us know what they're doing. So we can say, well, that was okay 10 years ago, but now you need to do this just a little different to bring it up to today's standards. Because the zoning changes that Jason talked about, that's an ongoing thing. We do that every year. We do it almost every month. They do it every month in the office. It doesn't come to us except for certain periods of time as a board. But we change those things all the time, and not detrimental, hopefully not to hurt the people, but to, to update the standards and to update what the town now wants to see. We've done everything from rezoning the downtown that you all probably know about to a village district so that it's got different utilization than it used to. We've done, we, we've changed, we try to keep it going. It's, a, it's an ongoing process is my, is my story. So um, I don't want to bore you guys to death. That's right, can, I, can you explain Absolutely. to everybody how you decide to go to the ZBA from the planning board back and what You mean as, as a um, applicant? Yeah. So. so if you say, I want to do something? Yeah. Okay. What happens is if a, if a person wants to do something with their property, they first take a look to see what they can do. And they can come into the planning office, and Jason and Lori can speak to them and tell them, this is what our requirements are, and this is the zone you are in, so this is what you're allowed. I don't know if it's about height or whatever. Yep. This, is what, this is what's allowed. They then look at it and they decide if that's what they want to do. And if they want to go higher, for instance, in height, because we've had those issues at the beach recently, then they have to go before the ZBA to say, it used to be 50 feet, but I don't want to get into that. Now it's higher down at the beach because we changed it, the planning board. We thought that this beach should go higher than 50. But Certainly if it's 50 feet and you want to go to 60, we can't say it's okay. You have to go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment, the ZBA. They get to talk to you and ask you other questions, and then you can tell them why you want to go to 60 feet. They say it's okay. You come back to the planning board, to, to, to Jason in the office. Eventually, you end up in front of us as a board, and you already have that adjustment. So now you can say, well, they gave me the adjustment. I can go higher. They gave me the variance. So we say, okay. 
and then we talk about other things. And then from there, as far as conservation stuff, the zoning board, I mean the planning board, I'm sorry, um, every month the Conservation Commission goes out and, and has walks on areas that somebody wants to do something on within the 50-foot buffer, too close to the marsh, to the ocean. And one of the zoning, one of the planning board members goes with them every month. We, we alternate. You take it this month, you take it next month, etc. When we come to the meeting, the planning board is the one that actually approves or disapproves the application for the impact of the wetlands. But we use very, very greatly, and, and Rayanne is, is really super, so is that whole conservation commission. They give us recommendations. We, we ask the applicant, do, do you read that letter? Yes. Do you agree to those stipulations from the conservation? Yes. Then we approve it, or, or if, if we don't, then, you know, I, I've never seen us not if the Conservation Commission is all okay with it. It's, it's come up a couple times where they weren't, and there, there were some issues, but that's, again, that's kind of boring. But, um, so, yes, we go out with the Conservation Commission. We work diligently with them. Their office is right next to Jason's office and Laurie's office. So we're very much intertwined, and we actually have to, by statute, go out and be with them. So we do that. I have a question about certificates of occupancy. Yes, and when he was talking about CFOs, that's what he meant when, so, yeah, earlier. Yeah. Well, my question is, can you use that to police bad tenant or landlord behavior? Can I'm sorry, Bob. Could you say that again? Can you use the certificate of occupancy to police bad tenant or landlord behaviors? Not necessarily, no. What you, what you can use it for is to make sure that that particular piece of property is up to spec as far as fire department, mm -hmm. um, egresses, and, and safety issues, <coughs> cleanliness. I, I, I suppose that the, that the health officer, who happens to be the building inspector in this town, could say that the, the, it's, it's not healthy enough for you to live there. But... We, we, we can't police bad tenants, no. And I was going to say, a certificate of occupancy is issued by the building department. What happens is that prior to issuance, in a lot of cases, not every case, but many cases, there's a sign-off sheet where various departments have to sign off. If it doesn't apply, they initial it not applicable. But, like, for example, if there's something that went before the planning board and requires a CFO sign-off, I check it versus the conditions. Make sure all the conditions that need to be met before that CFO sign-off have been met, before I sign it on behalf of the planning right. office. Behind, if, if they're not, then obviously we don't sign it. And, or we hold, we make sure yeah. we hold until, until they, they fix it. Off. Right. Yeah. There's no legal possibility to expand, to expand that authority at all? It's not, I'm not sure. It's not within my department's purview. It's, yeah. you know, the building. It's not, and it's not part of our, um, the regulations for the planning board as far as what we control in terms of what we can and can't do is, Site plans, subdivisions, change of occupancy. If, if John has, his, has a, a business and he wants to change it, that he's no longer going to do this business, he's going to change it to something else, then we look at the, the things such as parking and other impacts. And um, somebody wanted to, to um, we just got brought up a couple of weeks ago, somebody wanted to have a, a Christian reading room and they were going to sell sandwiches. They were going to make sandwiches and sell them to their own people. And we said, that's kind of your, your restaurant. You know, we're not. Well, yeah, you are. Because you are, they said, assembling sandwiches. The truth is, you're making food. You're and selling it to him. <laughs> He's going to sit there and eat it. That means you're a restaurant. Well, so the, we had the to say solution no. to that is you give the food for free, and then you ask for they, donations. They could have done that, but that's not they what they did. That. No. Okay, well, then but they did, it's okay, because we said <laughs> you can't. You, you can, by all means, have your reading room, but um, you just can't do the food unless, like you said, if you want to put out brownies for the for the group, go ahead. Yeah. I just I want to answer your question though. It, it, Lieutenant Gidley and uh, Deputy Hobbs, if there is an issue at a cottage, let's say up on let's say Boston Avenue, where they have forty people in that cottage. And, and, and five residents have called because of the noise and all of that. That doesn't happen in Hampton. When the sergeant, <laughs> when the, when the um, duty officer shows up, the first thing they do is check the certificate of occupancy. And they immediately tell them, you know, we'll be back here, you know, clear them out. 
and Walter's right. They have they have limits. The C, the, the yeah, COs. Yeah. Uh, my question, question would be: At what point could you withdraw the certificate of occupancy from the landlord? Who, those forty kids leave, and two weeks later, forty out of three. If they have enough complaints from the police department, to Kevin to the building inspector, to Kevin. Yes, Kevin can. Kevin, under the law, can revoke the certificate of occupancy. Oftentimes, too, I think it has something to do with the real estate people who yes. actually oh, me? rent no, it. Oh, because I do everything right. They, they, they need to monitor it sometimes, too. Yeah. No, they need to monitor how many people yeah. live there. I'm sure that the owners don't want the place to be destroyed unless, right. maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong, maybe no, one no, owner I, out of a hundred does, right. I, they don't care. But uh, well, it's the responsibility of the realtors to see. I would say my understanding from the building department is they also issue rental certificates of occupancy. So if there's new tenants, I believe they have to issue a new rental yeah. CMO every so often. I, yeah. I don't know exactly how that works, but I know, yeah. I, know they have, I know they have a specific rental CMO and I just thought I'd note that. Yeah. But it's different from the, from the beach. The beach, we have cottages that we rent by the week. That's what so we do. We We've got them. And they don't go every week and ask for another CO. Uptown, different story. Or here, if you want to rent it for a year, different story. If you're going to do the seasonal stuff like this beach does, then you're, once you get the occupancy permit, then you're allowed to occupy the building. If you exceed the, the amount of people that are supposed to be in there, they're not supposed to. And somebody can go down and say to the landlord, you've got too many people in that in that cottage for this week and they can cease and desist from doing it as far as long-term issues that the same people keep renting to we can't stop that we can only deal with it we can't project that you might be doing something wrong all we can say is you are doing something wrong so please don't do it any longer and you have to have your tenants to go that's not the planning board when i say we i mean the town yeah. i mean us all of us so yes there, there are ways to address that kind of an issue, but it doesn't land on the planning board's docket. That, that needs, go ahead, John. Yeah. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of hotels on the beach, and there's less and less hotels. Condos are great, mm -hmm. but what I get from the baseball from the letters and stuff like that to Mark is that there's less and less of the, the hotels that they can rent. I know the condos, some of them are rentable, mm -hmm. but it's not like they can go into Chuck's and go, I want, you know, four days only. You know, right. usually the condo is going to want to go the whole period. Uh, we just recently had a hotel that has small fire, uh, you know, in the back. And, and I, Chuck Belmore, yep. yep. And there was a lot of water damage because mm -hmm. it was up in the attic and they just poured it in. Um, and then they spent maybe the next, I don't know, a good month ripping out all the moldable stuff. The, the carpets went. All the sheetrock went, and basically, you know, the shell now. It's a shell, and it, it had been updated with the windows and been worked on in the last four or five years. And now, all of a sudden, the owner is going to rip it down. That's. This what is where we, we I get. Miss, I miss. I've been watching. It okay. And I haven't seen. No, that's news. So this is this is what this is what happens. Um, thank God we all live in America. The owner of the property has the right to do whatever he wants to it. And as long as what he does falls within our perimeters of what the town has already voted on and agreed to, as far as what you can do with your property, that you can't hurt your neighbors, etc., then he can do it. If he wants to tear it down, it didn't even have to be damaged by fire. If he wanted to come there and rip it down, that's his property. He can we as a planning board and we as a town, there's nothing we can do about it, whether we like it or not. Oh, I understand that. But his intent after talking with him, or before talking with yes. him, and seeing the yep. meeting, was that he would have liked to. Um, I mean, if he was going to tear it down like this, right. he would have spent probably. Oh, no question. I, I, I saw what he did. Oh, yeah. 125,000. Right yeah, it was a lot more than 30. Yeah. Yeah, 125. Sure. Yeah, so it's like, can we help these hotels that are like. My, like my house, 120 years ago. Yes, old. yes, we can. To answer your question, we can. If they came to us and said, we want to keep the shell because we've ripped out the center and we want to rebuild it as long as it was structurally safe and the building department and all the engineers said, yes, this is safe, then absolutely, we would love to work with you to keep that. I don't want to see your house go at all. But if you choose to, if you say, I want to fix it, 
then we'll get our engineers, we'll get the build. everybody will come down and help. This town, people don't realize it because we only hear the stuff that's, that this hurt me because they wouldn't let me do this. This town wants to work with everybody. And I didn't know it until I started doing this. We want to help. We, if you say, Brendan, this is what I want. I really want to keep my house because it's 120 years old. I'll do whatever I can to help you. As long as it all falls within our current ordinances and statutes and the building department is so everybody's on board, absolutely. We'll do whatever you can. If Chuck decides to, to keep the building and just, I'm right there. Yep. If he needs to raise it, meaning drop it to the ground, then he has to. If that's what he has to do. In the meantime, he's got two parking areas that he was using for the hotel in past years that are now vacant. So he came to us and asked, can I have a temporary parking permit? And we said, of course. So the, the, the issue that Chuck had is the when you when you have to remodel more than 50% of the property, anything that you were grandfathered in, so our buildings are all old. So the stairway, maybe it was only five feet and it needs to be six feet. I'm just throwing round numbers. Mm -hmm. The hallways weren't wide enough. So he wasn't able to rebuild what was there because he was remodeling more than 50% of the property. Yeah, he's right. So when you start to spend the money, it's going to cost him more to rehab the old building than to put something new up. Right. So that would, that's from, that's what I understand. Talking no, to he's him, right. that's yeah. why he made the decision that it's really not worth it. Absolutely correct. If he had known this before, maybe he, he wouldn't have ripped out everything the way he did. And, uh, well, and what happens, too, is the country says we have international building standards. That's what we do. The country says you can't have those small stairs anymore. You need to have bigger ones. Any new projects from X state could have been the 70s, could have been the 60s, could have been the 90s. As they continue on, they say, well, from now on, we want this because it's safety and, it, and there's reasons. Nobody does this, you know, just on the spur of the minute. These are all well thought. So now they have new regulations for a reason. And so as, as Chuck said, I mean, unfortunately, he has no choice but to bring it up to today's standards. What's here now is okay, and it works. If it's gone, then you have to bring up everything new. You have to do it today's way. That's his dilemma. Sprinkler systems. Absolutely. Well, he there had you no go. Problem. He had no right problem with the sprinkler one. system. Huh? He had no problem with the sprinkler system. No, he's saying, I guess what Walter's saying is that now you need sprinkler systems, where 30 finished. years ago, you, everything's changed. Parking, 40 years ago, not, not the same. Driveways, not the same. Sidewalks, not the same. Everything has changed. And, and the government didn't do it to be mean. The government did it with citizens like us to improve things for the future. So there's no maliciousness in anything that this board or any board does as far as planning goes. We just do what, what, what's, what's today. It's what we do. And hopefully it'll last tomorrow and next year and the years to come. I have a, kind of a final global question. Yeah. What is the biggest mistake people tend to make when they come before you? I'm not sure. Can, can you minimize that question just a little? Well, I don't words. like the color of your shirt, well, sir. So. No, no. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'll give you an example of what the Zoning Board of Variance said. They said the biggest mistake a lot of people make is appearing before us without counsel. Okay. They don't understand the rules of the game. Uh, have you, has, have you noticed the same sort of issue? Not necessarily. The, the ZBA is, is a little different. They have five criteria that, that the applicants yeah. are, have to meet for them to um, vote or, 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 or suggest it to meet. And then the ZBA can make up their own minds. Sometimes that needs counsel. Sometimes you need a lawyer, depending on the project and what you're trying to, what your variance is, is trying to do, what your adjustment is looking for. Sometimes you don't. I had to go to ZBA a few years ago to put an outdoor ATM right next to the boardwalk because I was two inches into the town sidewalk. Didn't need a lawyer. Needed to explain what I was doing, show them pictures, and talk about how it wouldn't affect the public. And um, that's, what, that's what I did. That was my own personal experience. It's intimidating. I mean, you sit in front of them, and, and, and I'm, every board, you guys are intimidating. No, that's perfect. Oh, yes, you are. That's just, more, that's just Maureen. <laughs> 
Nobody, nobody yeah. wants to go before. I mean, if you don't have to go before a board, why would you? So when you do, we try to make it as as user friendly and 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 we and we we're, we're nice people like you guys are. So if people go before the ZBA and they don't have the right counsel, that's that's a, that's a drag. They come before us if it's something simple, um, a change of use. They can just tell us what they're doing, and mm -hmm. nine out of nine point five times we're going to say okay. We just you know you can't put that sign like that or something. You know we just go over the the parameter. We just go over the rules and explain that you can do. That. I know you do, and, and the project at the corner of uh, Ocean Boulevard and P Street, which took forever to get because of the neighborhood's uh, activists that want the uh, quaint fishing village look when you come to the beach, which we'll never, ever have again. But we need to address some of these projects because that project didn't have enough electricity to put in the three-phase equipment that they needed for the elevators and for the amount of condominiums that were being built. And they couldn't come off of Ocean Boulevard with the right amount of voltage because that section of the beach, the voltage is, a, is lower, so they had to come in off of Ashworth Avenue with the higher voltage which mean, meant changing the voltage at in front of our new precinct parking lot where they had the utilities had to step down transformers to the lower voltage. Now our whole neighborhood is all double poles because of that one condominium project. And we may never see these double poles removed. I think you will, Walter. I think that ultimately what, what the plan, right now, what, what the planning board does right now, like for instance, at 377 Ocean Boulevard, there's going to be a building and there's going to be, I think, six units in the back. Six in the back, yep. Everything is underground. We don't have poles there. From now on, or it's been this way for a little while, we put the conduit under, underground. There are no more poles. No, everything is, the, the poles are the poles that are on the streets. That already, like, well, I guess my, that have service. Right, but my point is eventually upgrade, those will go away, eventually. They had to upgrade from 2,400 volts yes. to 13,700 volts in order to run the three-phase equipment that that new condominium needed. Granted, yes, the underground does go to the new condominiums, right. but they had to upgrade the whole neighborhood voltage yep. All the way to the end of Harris right. Avenue, right. and all the way up, you know, Q Street. Right. And I mean, the people who live in the neighborhood know it was a three-hour power outage when they finally did the cutover. But, like I said, we're left with the poles that went in in 1960 that were 35-foot poles. Right to new 45-foot poles like we have on the leaded streets, and we must have 25 double poles now in our neighborhood that... You don't like it. We'll stay there forever. Yeah. Well, our new parking lot is being affected by a double pole. There, there are some things that even planning, the planning department, the planning board, there are some things that... that we don't have control over. And if Jason would like to step in, he can, but I'm yeah, not sure actually, if he needs to, I, but go ahead. Well, I do. And actually, it piggybacks, I think, on Bob's question here. The, the biggest mistake that applicants can make is that the applicant and or their engineer doesn't always do deep enough due diligence on their projects a lot of times. You know, we catch that during PRC. Sometimes it's not caught there. Sometimes it's caught by the planning board, and sometimes it makes its way through because it's not something that we're necessarily looking for. We also rely on the expertise of other staff and Unitil and Aquarian and so forth in making the reviews. So, so I mean, there's a lot of people involved, and, you know, I, I think, but I think that goes hand in hand. I think it's just sometimes, you know, sometimes all of the I's and, are dotted and T's are crossed, and, and sometimes and they're not. And, the, and, 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 the, and we... Do our best to pick up on those right things. and but we're secondary that's the you have to understand say. too when these when, when somebody wants to build something they hire engineers they they pay a lot of money to build if those engineers don't pick up on it shame on them if it falls into the jason lap and we find it sorry 
go pay your engineers more money to hopefully get it right. And that's we have many what the PR. What we, we 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 talk about a PRC. What that is is that that's a, um, a plan review committee. We used to be able. To, people used to come in with plans, and they would just get pushed right through. And, and we, we look at them and say, "Oh my goodness, We've got to talk to these guys. We've got to talk to the fire department. We've got to talk to the building department. We've got to talk to DPW." Not anymore. <coughs> a couple of years ago, we, we revised it so that from now on, when you want to build something, you come, you get a meeting. The building department is there. The um, DPW, Jennifer Hale, or or um, or the director is there. The police, sometimes, sometimes not, because it depends on what the project is. The fire department checks it out. Jason checks it out. We check out the deeds. We check out everything you can imagine. Things that I wouldn't even think of. Things that laymen like me and you would never even think that we need to go through this. But they do it. And they do it now before that project gets pushed to a point where we start to ask, can I come in front of the board and, and, and present it? Before, years ago, it wasn't like that. Now, we catch, we, we try to catch everything, not just for the town, but for the applicant, so you don't have to come back to us six times. We try to get it so by the time you're in front of this board, you're ready to go. We just have to tweak things. The DPW's weighed in, the fire, everybody. The planning department, weighed in. Everybody says yes. Or no, and you got to fix this. You got to do that. There's sewerage problems all over the town, not the beach, everywhere. They have to fix the sewers. They have to do pump station stuff. They have to do a lot of stuff. We've got stormwater, stormwater management pro, uh, policies in place now that weren't in place ten years ago. They are now, so that your property doesn't get affected by what he just built. We've got all kinds of things that are new, and the plan review committee is, it's vital to make it so that the applicant doesn't have to keep on coming back and revising, coming back and revising. Our engineers, our town he's mentioned CMA, that's our town engineers. We, we hire them yearly to be our engineers, to look out for the town and to talk to their engineers because they speak the same language. I don't. I couldn't tell an engineer what to do. I don't know. I know you guys do a great job, and I know also that... You know, like you said, once a month a, a member will go with the Conservation Commissioner and, and they'll walk. But, but also, the regular committee members do a lot on their own. You know, Fran goes out. I know Fran goes out. Fran's a great gentleman. I know you go out because you and I have met each other many an evening. Yep. That you're out walking and going to look at a piece of property. Yep. Town bylaws are wrong with the ADA park and temporary. How's that? ADA parking now for temporary parking lots or any parking lots is for every five spaces, one ADA. Well, we'll certainly look into that. that. changed in 2012, and our town bylaws are still well, wrong I'm, for I'm, temporary parking. All right. Um, let's back up just a second. The last time I looked at the ADA, which I do check out regularly for other reasons other than the planning board, but I, I do it for the planning board as well. The last time I looked at it, the ADA regulations were one for every 25. Since then, um, the town's regulations for temporary parking lots are much stringent. They are one for every 15 spaces, whereas a regular parking lot, if you've got a parking lot with 200 spaces, it's supposed to be one for every 25. I will double check, Walter. I guarantee you we will check it out. Jason's got it right now. It's registered. It's five for one. Well, we'll check it. You know, if that's the case, then, then that, but that, that's not just temporary parking lots. That's a parking lot standard. So if that's the case, and you're telling me every single buddy down here, anywhere, that's got 20 spaces needs four. Okay, well, we're going to look at that. And if that's the case, then we will absolutely change it. No question. If it's not, if it stays at 25 with the national, and then we put in 15 for temporary because we knew that small parking lots still might take more than one you know, handicap spots, we put it to every 15, which is better than the national. But if, if, if Walter's right, then yeah, we'll change it, absolutely. Yep. Through a public hearing and through the normal diligence that the town does. But absolutely, Walter, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Brian, did you need? Yeah, um, someone's screaming in my ear. Um, with all these other things, the studies and everything else, are we reviewing the fee? Any fees being added on? Well, we recently, yes, we recently, um, when I say recently, I mean within the last six months or so, 
maybe seven. Jason can chime July in. But 1st. yeah, so July first of last year, we increased our fee schedule, and not we didn't double it. We just increased our fee schedule to cover what we considered the cost of Jason reviewing plans and of of what we do as a as a department. Uh, building department has their own fees. We have our own fees. Filing fees, copies, um, mailings. I mean, all of that has been increased negligent. I mean, increased small increase, but to match today's dollars and cents, last job, last job, yes. And it wasn't, and it wasn't just arbitrary numbers. It involved an extensive look at what other communities yeah. are doing. Took us a couple to months make, to make sure that we're comparable with, with comparable yep. communities. You, we don't want to be the town that nobody wants to come to. We're the town that, if you come here and you apply for something. We're just like the, the other guys, only we might have our own specifics because I don't mean about the building standards. I'm talking about the fees. The fee schedule is going to be mirroring some of the neighboring communities. We obviously have special needs because we're on the seacoast because we're a beach and in town is different. Their floods are not your floods, totally different. But fee-wise, yes, we've increased it and we're, we're like the, the other towns, so yes. Okay, because I'm saying, you know, where it seems to be in down like 146. Yep. Um, it seems like put a heavy burden on these people, you know, going through the paperwork and everything else. Yeah. And I just want to see what covering our costs. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Anybody else? I just have a quick question. What yeah. is the name of that legislation? That it's called Senate Bill 146, okay. SB 146. I've got a copy if you'd like. We yeah, can email that to you. I'll, I'll email you a copy. Okay, yeah, you can read it. You can read it. Act relative to accessory dwelling units, it's yeah. called. So. We'll, okay. we'll make sure you have a copy. Anybody else that wants one, just write down your email address. We'll, we'll email you all of it so you can read it. It's, so it's written in English, and I, I mean that in a, in a good way. I don't mean like Spanish, oh, English. I've read like I mean, about it's, it's layman's terms. Yeah. I mean, this is it's, it's written in, in regular terms that I can understand. If I can understand it, you guys can understand it, believe me. So it's written normal. It's not written in engineering stuff, right? so to speak. Any other questions before we bid adieu? I think that's it. I want to thank you for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure. Invite us back. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Have coffee and donuts. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Absolutely. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thanks for coming in. Okay. Thanks, Jason. All right, so we're going to approve minutes of February 10th meeting. Yeah. As much. How many? Four more. Holy Moses. I think so. All right, we'll start with February 10th. So, uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes as presented? I'll move to present them. Okay. <laughs> approve the minutes as I'll presented. Second. All in favor? Okay. So March 9th. No, the next one is uh, is February 16th. It the small one here? Oh, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the minutes of the special budget meeting that we had on February 16th. Uh, do I have a motion to move them as presented? I move to present them as presented. Approve them as presented. <laughs> Second. Present them as All approved. All in favor. It's All right. right. <laughs> March 9th. March 9th. Uh, do I have a motion to approve them as presented? I move to approve them as presented. Second. All in favor? So t I have to abstain. I wasn't here. Okay, we're flying now. Yeah. So the annual village district meeting, March 25th. I have a motion to move the minutes as presented. I move to approve them as presented. We're getting that right after seven trials. All in favor? Unanimous. Excellent. Okay. Do we have any public yeah. comment? I, I guess you're first. For the maestro, Walter <coughs> Kiffman, 10 Fellows Avenue. Glenn, um, when are we going to start? May 7th. May 7th will be our first concert. Every right. Saturday in May until Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and we start the third week of June every night. Great. Thank you very, very much for all you do. Thank you. John Kane, um, 
Brian Wilson, what did you, did you send him a copy of that? Remember he asked for that? Did you already do that? Yeah. Thank you. He wanted to know when you were beginning, and, and John said it was going to be early. Same as last year. Okay. So it starts May what? May 7th. May 7th. Thank you. When is the, um, the March, the prom I will March. discuss that now. <laughs> I got, let me let me uh, rephrase that, Maureen. <laughs> when is the prom march? There and are you prom. in it? I just wanted to say that on. And are on, you singing before they come? No. Out? All right. She's playing on the May 21st, <laughs> the juniors will be parading across the stage. And my son um, will be one of them. Will he? Yes. Excellent. Wow, you're getting old. Uh, yeah. He's not we my oldest. He's not my band. oldest. Excuse me. We have a band oh, that uh, Mr. French. <laughs> Secured. The Continentals earlier. will be playing as opposed to, I don't think they had any music last year, I don't remember. No. Oh, the Continentals, they, a new band? The, they, they're a we'll band also every have a, an arbor, which we also secured, Mr. French secured for us, that we will be having decorated, and it will look a little bit better than just a plant, a plant, and kids. It'll be a, a, a little more. <coughs> for the arbor. I would have no idea, nor do I care. Anyway, so we're going to have a, um, on the 21st, they're going to come, in, and thanks to uh, Rachel Roberge, uh, who we've been in contact with, a lovely girl, teacher at the high school. Uh, we've been in contact with her and her prom committee, lovely group of kids, wonderful, enthusiastic kids. We will be doing that for them on the 21st of May. At 5.30. Well, they'll be there at 5.30. We'll be there earlier. A.M. or P.M.? They will march at 5.30, correct? Can I make a motion that we have our, our Friesen Park a lot open for free parking for the parents of those children? No. <laughs> no. You, can, no you can make a motion. If, they, if you can't make a motion, <laughs> you can make a motion. You can make a motion. This is a public, the public, the public, annual meeting. Yeah, you know, that would night. be a difference. Uh, that would be a different Let me see if there's a concert. Let me see if there's a concert that night. Yeah. But it would be nice if we could accommodate the parents. Big grandparents. I'm trying to think of what they did before. And elderly parents. Of As of this time, there's no concert. So why don't we uh, why don't we postpone that motion until next? Week? I'm not making a motion. I'm just asking. Well, can we get, well you can't make a motion. Consider but. waving, <laughs> parking that evening for no, grandparents, aunts, uncles, parents of children of the elderly that have juniors. That's right. What cousins twice you <laughs> What'd you say? Cousins play. Oh, cousins play. Yeah, those so as as of now, there isn't a concert on the twenty first. Um, there isn't. That is this an extra concert? So, but let's not make the decision yet. Okay. So that so we could we could make the decision in uh, next month's meeting. Because they're up to two bucks an hour. We need us at that time. Yeah. No, I think that's we'll great. We'll match anything the town does. <laughs> and the state as well. And the state. I think it's a nice gesture. Can I move on? Are we, are we on new business? What are we on? No, we're supposed to be on. What are we on now? Yeah, we still got power. Yeah, we still have uh, public comment. Can, it, okay. can we wait on this? Sure, I can wait. I'll be quick. <laughs> What choice do I have? Okay, um, Kathy Silver, Blue Ocean Society, Blue Ocean Discovery Center. First of all, we'd like to thank all the voters of the vi village district for increasing the amount of money f from the floor at the village district <coughs> meeting. We appreciate it very much, um, and it's it's very <laughs> it's very much needed. And as I say, we do appreciate it. Um, just to go over what's what we've done recently, on March 15th, we had at the Discovery Center a workshop on seaweed. Terry and Helen came. It sounds and exciting. It was. We learned all about how these are now sea vegetables. Right, ladies? Yes. I would need them. <laughs> <laughs> I, on the other hand, would. I would, too. And I have. All right. This is the new thing in... Food. So, uh, actually, it was almost it was standing room only that night. We were, it was really quite well attended. Last mm -hmm. night at Winnicott High School, we presented a video on called "Bag It," which was ha having to do with recycling and um, preventing the use or stopping the use of 
the plastic bags and emphasizing reusing and reducing rather than recycling, that those really need to come first. It's the whole reuse and reduce that recycle is really the final option. We have many coming events. Um, uh, we have a new tank in the Discovery Center. Um, my husband and I sanded it and painted it on Saturday and Sunday. I now have to build the filter for it. But as soon as I get that all set, we'll be turning it into a very big tide pool. It's eight feet by four feet. It's an old, um, well, former, not old, but former lobster pound tank. And it's right down on the floor so children can look right in and reach into it and say it's, it's good sized. So we're very excited about that. We have about 150 Girl Scouts coming there this weekend. So if you see a lot of activity Saturday morning, they'll be doing a beach, um, whole beach cleanup procedure and coming into the Discovery Center. Then they're moving to Winnicott High School in the afternoon where we've got our big inflatable whale and a whole program for them there. There are many cleanups scheduled for April and May. I think one or two every Saturday. So there's lots to do. Um, we have many school programs coming up where we take the animals and go to a school. And then our big, big day is June 4th. This is the day that we're celebrating World Oceans Day. And we at 9 a.m., we have a Run for the Ocean 5K and Walk. It's going to be on the boardwalk and the sand. And if anybody wants to run or walk in that, it's easy to register. You just go on blueoceansociety.org. We especially need lots of volunteers. We want to line the race route so that people know where to go, so that we can cheer them on. So it's... We figure that's going to be like 9 to 10.30 in the morning. So, you know, if you get that Saturday morning, we would love to have the help. At 10.30 that morning, we're having a big, big beach cleanup. And then at 12 noon, we have live music and a concert on the, the Shell stage. So it is a big, big day. And then we officially open every day starting June 18th. So... We have a lot planned, Great. and we need help. What about the 22nd of April? Isn't that Earth Day? It is, and that's what I say. That we have, um, well, we've got workshops for teachers going on, and we have uh, lots of different cleanups coming. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there's just way too many for me to even list. Like, like I said, two or three a day. So just go online, take a look there. Oh, yeah, from... Maine to Gloucester. <laughs> okay. So we, we really cover a large area. Yeah. Okay. So that's... When they're doing the cleanup of the beach, tell them not to forget the playground. I know you guys I know. Do. I always... <laughs> I personally do the playground. All right, great. Okay. Yeah. I, I okay. wanted to ask you about June 4th and the music. Is that going to interfere? Do you have a no, band? No, we're, we're, we're all... Together? Oh, we're um, great friends. We've been band band well, he needs somebody. somebody. <laughs> Go ahead. See you up. It's just... Park and we're going to book them again that night. So oh, band doesn't <laughs> oh, nice. um, you also have something going on on June 20th. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. You are absolutely right. <laughs> okay. June 25th, we have the Environmental Awards from the Aquarian Water Company. That'll be on the stage, and then there's a reception in the Discovery Center. Is and that in the afternoon? I, I think this time it is. Other times it's been in the morning, but I think this year it is okay. in the afternoon. Yep. Thanks, Glenn. I, I'm just so focused on June 4th. That <laughs> I'm just trying to manage my... I understand. I do Chuck understand. Chuck would like to know when the next seafood cooking demonstration oh, the will be held. The seaweed? Yeah. Seaweed. Oh, yes. seaweed. Seafood That's I would handle. <laughs> yes. Well, we make pudding and ice cream out of it, too. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You know, like then, then they can call you. Who? John Kane. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I hope so, too. I, I, I really do. I would like to recognize this John. Now? You can. Any way you go on vacation and you're in a Hampton Beach t-shirt, everyone stops you and said, we all, they come to Hampton Beach. Because of John. I met more Canadians this winter that are so excited. You know, I read the article, we are saying we might not have them. I mean, they're still coming. We met Canadians on vacation this, this winter. That, oh, they're, they're still, still coming, just not so as many. Yeah. To be coming yeah. to the beach. You know? And everywhere you go, when they see the hand. Oh, let's hear it for John Kay. Who? Who? His head exploded. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. There's more things for you to say. Any other comments from the public? Regina, do you want to throw in anything? Or how, what's the story with our pump? and pipes and with the, the uh um, well, that is still being researched it's going to be monitored you know constantly okay so it's right now we have the old still old we fixed the piping leak. oh you fixed oh all right so the leak has been fixed okay. there was a uh, apparently engineers 30 40 years ago whenever it was decided that where the joint where the pipes meet the joint i'm not sure what it's called is something real the joint yeah it's the joint all right they stabilize it by using rocks. Mm -hmm. Which ate And over time, one of the rocks actually ate a hole into the pipe. But now the concern is that there's probably approximately 200 of those joints exist in the 4,000, 5,000 foot pipe, however long it is. So whether they do that in other spots in just a matter of time. They I probably act, do. Yeah, probably. They may have done it. I would say probably. Because they use the rocks to level everything. Put right. everything where they exactly wanted it, but they left them in there. So, so when will we know more? We will know more when, right now, Fred has talked to uh, the director. The town manager has talked to the director and says, beach closing can't happen, won't happen, it's not going to happen. So they have procedures in place where that if the pipe does give way, they're going to continue to monitor it. However, they test the pressure, and if it does happen, DPW has 48 hours to get a temporary pipe put up that will work the same way as the one underground does. They'll put it up above the marsh because I guess we're going to have to wait till March for the next town I'll meeting to vote on everything because he says by the time the summer's over and then to try to schedule a new, a, you know, a special meeting between then and March is probably, there's not going to be enough time. So worst case, the pipe does go. DPW will have it within 48 hours. All right, so worst, worst case, if they deny this, the town voters vote, vote down this, what happens then? Isn't it a safety issue that it has to be done? Well, yeah, I mean, to me, I think the state should, if that really did happen, then, I mean, I would like to see the state jump in. I think they will. The state's not going to jump in and pay for it. They might jump in and tell us we have to do it. Right, but then how are we going to do it if we don't have the money? And I actually... Well, that's what I mean. It should... Another point, I actually just joined a... And I don't have my notes written. I don't have my fancy notes written down about it with me here tonight. But it's called Water Innovations Alliance. And it's a... Uh, a friend of mine, actually, is the founder of it. And it's dealing with municipalities all over the country that have the same exact problems that Hampton does. Because pipes are rotting under the ground from New York to L.A. And they address what the government is doing about it and how there's not enough money to fix the problems. So I'm hoping that by getting in onto these conference calls, which I think are going to start next week, I'll be able to listen in on how other municipalities are dealing with the situation. But it's going to... I mean, because it could happen that they voted down. We vote a lot of things down. They voted the school down. They, you know, well, they voted and the then, school down, and they voted the bond, the, the DPW, so, the $2 million bond for DPW. All right, so then it's an emergency break. Then it will be an emergency. And then I then, guess I believe, talking to Fred, that when it's an emergency, a, state, a town emergency, I guess, like that, selectmen have the authority to do whatever needs to be done if it's declared an emergency. Which, and if it's emergency, it probably costs 20% more, if not more right. than that. So I think what we need to do is, what I'm going to try to do is, and I, the other selectmen are also 
I'm going to try to do the same thing. It's just we need to get people to know what's going on. This can't happen. If we don't have water, guess what? Schools aren't going to matter. Businesses aren't going to matter. Houses aren't going to matter. Because if we don't have water, we don't have anything. So I think we just need to make sure that that gets out to everyone. It's a real serious issue. It's not DPW looking for money. This is something that needs to get done. Right. Okay. And Jennifer... If you want to go see her, she opened up a policy there. You can go and ask her any questions you want. Well, I, I think that, um, I don't know if we should make a motion that we're behind this effort. Uh, and whatever whatever the town needs us to do, we'll, we'll help with promoting it. So, you know, should we make Thank that motion? That. motion or just, yeah. yeah, I would move that we support the town fully in making sure we don't get faced with a ruptured pipe with no capability to repair it and ultimately subjected to federal fines for doing nothing about it because we're not repairing it. I have a second. I will second that. Oh, okay. Okay. So you have our support. Thank you. No. All right. Yeah, Toll Street. Toll mm -hmm. well, Pipe Uptown's not. Yeah, but that's an easy yeah. fix. <laughs> <laughs> Pipe failures, I mean, you see them every day. Look at the news, yeah. every day, yeah. every town, every yeah. city. Right. Any closing comments, Monique? Yes, I do, okay. Mr. Major. <laughs> On uh, May 29th, from 1 to 4 p.m., that's the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend, weather permitting, we are going to have, uh, for the first time, a preliminary um, auditions on the stage for anyone who wants to enter into the talent competition. Uh, we will also have the regular way of doing that, which would be to send it into to send the application into Seashell Entertainment. We will never give that up. But this is just a little extra to see if we can't get some talent on that particular day. So please come, please sing, if you can sing, and please come and watch. Uh, we hope to have a lot of people there, and I'm hoping it'll be a beautiful day. Is there a weather date? Weather no, plan. I don't think so. Well, it's going to be a beautiful weekend. Yeah, thank you. The answer is maybe, but we're not saying anything. Yeah, we, we might, you know, we're going to advertise it as the 29th. And that's, you know. Well, the weatherman just told us it's going to be great, Excuse so we're in good shape. All right, good. <laughs> Maureen, could I ask you a question about the talent contest? <coughs> you said come and sing. Now, yeah. what if you... A juggler? What, what if your talent is... Acrobatics or then I hope or, somebody will have an acrobatic contest. Okay, so that would be. But that unfortunately, would be this is a singing are you competition. Oh, no, no, it's a singing competition. It's only it singing. Is a are singing you starting a new uh, No dancing, event? no playing the harmonica. Well, no, no, <coughs> America's Got Talent. They have. Yeah. They do juggling. This, this is they do not America's Got Talent. Okay. This is Hampton, Hampton Beach has, Talent Competition. He's, he's having a flashback to the Ed Sullivan show. Okay, never mind. Thank God the Red Sox are back for us. And I want to make one more comment. It came to my attention. Yesterday, that I don't know if you watch The Voice. Does anyone watch The Voice? Yes. Caroline Burns is one of ours. She was, I believe, she won. Did she not? Yeah, I think she did. Yeah. She, uh, I think she was a junior too. Uh, she's from Hollis, New Hampshire, and she's still in the competition. So, Caroline Burns is her name. I'll yeah. try to get it up on Facebook. What, what I get about all the pictures? Yeah. Okay, put her. She's. Uh, she's. You know what year? Sure. Uh, if you go, if you Google her, it'll tell you what year. Okay. I think. I think. I'm not sure about that. Check the show. Well, that wouldn't have anything to do with us, though. No, yeah, but I. Yeah, but I. I'll see if I can find that out for you. But I'm not really sure I can. But anyway, I just wanted everybody to know to watch her. She's quite good. And uh, it was kind of a big deal since we discovered her, didn't we, Glenn? <laughs> she did. Oh, really? Wow. Wow. Yes, Mr. Kane. I would like, on, on that note, Glenn has got a, uh, it's booked an act that I'm all excited about. Really? A totally new venue. Um, <laughs> on Sunday nights, I don't know if you Continentals. <laughs> Bob, <laughs> yeah, it's different. You're gonna like it. What is it? Um, on Sunday, I believe it's on Sunday nights. It's called the Big Little Shots or the Little Big Shots. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and great. we're yes. having the Little Big Shots coming to Hampton Beach. Oh, are they? <laughs> when is that? It's great. Oh, I've seen them. What is, yeah, is funny. it? Is it? Uh, uh, I haven't seen it. Are they jugglers? 
Yeah. Is Steve Harvey Harvey coming too? Yes. Get Steve. I'd like to have Steve here too. Oh, I like him. August twenty third. It's a Tuesday night. I'm not sure I understand how they're doing that. What? What is well, it? A separate we'll, little we'll show? We'll oh, okay. It's, it's funny show. I've seen it. I've show. seen it. Yeah. All right. All right. I believe. Bob, I'm any closing comments? Uh, the planning for the July sixth event for kids, approximately eight to fourteen, is fairly well along, and we should be uh, producing some public information concerning that very soon. One other note, uh, we should all be encouraged by what we heard tonight, but we read the paper, it was rather dire about the potential future of this community. What these people are telling us is they're not only aware, they're engaged, they're involved, and they're doing what they can to make that not happen. So this is, to me, one of the many reasons why having a district exist is a good thing. It's an opportunity to uh, gain information from those that represent us in many different types of capacities and share it with the greater community. And then, yeah, done. Um, <laughs> just for people on, on watching TV, I want to um, remind them that many businesses are opening at the beach full time. Sea Catch just went full time. Boardwalk is open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, Ballroom. Ballroom. Uh, there's work being done on Bernie's. They're going to be opening the, the old section soon. Um, and parking. Parking. Oh, and the parking meters are going to start the 17th, which I think is Monday. But I have not seen the kiosk out yet. So if you don't see a kiosk, park for free. I believe they're putting in all new meters. I believe they are, too. Uh, and in the, am I correct in that, yeah. uh, Mr. Lett? Yeah. Yes, uh, Mr. Wilson, we had a meeting with him, and they're putting in new... The pay meters. The pay the meters. The one you go and get the ticket from. Yeah. Right. So, so that's what I'm saying, the kiosk meters. meters but they right. haven't been... Is the not... price the same? Yes. I think I saw those down at the... <coughs> oh, so they had them around? I kind of heard a rumor that they might not make this 17... Oh, no, I don't so, think they will. I, so so, feel no, free. I, I noticed Senator Stiles sponsored a bill to raise the parking rate at the meters to be it, in competition against yeah. the economy. So, that, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a little deceiving that way. What it is is they can adjust the rates of the, the meters. The daily rates. The daily rates. So, and, and so some days might be less, some right. days might be higher. And um, that's it just what our... Will never be lower. All right. Well, that's just what our parking lots do now, it's and, with the the, it's, you know, and, and uh, yeah. if we want to continue to have great buildings and great bathhouses and have all that stuff, the state needs to make money. And if we want the state to give us back money, if they're making money, we got to ask them for it. They have to show we have. Yeah. If they're making the money, we should get more of it back. So that's yeah, well, we're working on it. At all times, we work on it. We have a governor who lives one town away, and she was blind. Well, we're not going to get political on that note. Adjourn the meeting. Yeah. But I agree. Yeah. <laughs>